Welcome to or welcome back to Wrong Sports and I continue to go through the 1960s in my previous episode I did a little detour I talked about the Illinois slush fund this time I'm going to talk about another slush fund this time one that happened on the campus of Colorado now if you happen to not know what a slush fund is it was actually a pretty big thing that happened throughout the 1940s and 50s it mostly started after World War II but got really big in the 1950s and the slush fund was a secret to the public but were well known on campuses around the country and they were known to fund scholarships for athletes and even help the athletic department cover some other expenses but even though they were pretty much everywhere some teams went a little too far and were caught resulting in penalties that tampered programs for years this slush fund scandal not only hurt the school but resulted in the first termination of a coach for improper recruiting practices which as you noticed did not happen in my previous episode talking about Illinois. Again, if you missed that one, I will put a link down below in the description. But before I get to the Colorado slush fund scandal, make sure if you are not already subscribed to the channel below, make sure you ring the bell, give this channel a like, give this video a like, share these videos with other college football fans, and you can check out my podcast and also help out the channel on my Patreon. All the links are in the description below. But before I get into the scandal, I gotta break down one of the biggest characters in this story. His name is Everett Sonny Grandulus. You might know him if you are a Michigan State fan or alumni, but if you don't remember him, he was a fantastic athlete from Muskegon Heights, Michigan. He would show his athletic abilities as he was a quarterback and a fullback and led the high school to two state titles in 1945 and 46. He would then matriculate to Michigan State and would get on the field in 1948, but would finally start in 1949 and 50. He would have two 100-yard rushing games in 1949, but would really break out in 1950 as he had five 100-yard rushing games out of 10 and rushed for over 1,000 yards, making him the first Michigan State player to run for over 1,000 yards. His fantastic college career ended, and he went on a one-year career in the NFL playing for the Giants, but he couldn't show what he did in college as he only averaged two yards a carry in the NFL and would swiftly go back to his alma mater as he would be an assistant under Duffy Daugherty. He would be Duffy's top assistant for the next five years, before he got his first coaching opportunity at the University of Colorado in 1959. And this was pretty big at the time because he was only 29 and Colorado was looking for not only a name to bring in better athletes, but to also break the glass ceiling known as Oklahoma in the Big 8 which had won the conference for the better part of the last 10 years. Colorado wasn't a bad team. They were actually really good, as they had winning records all throughout the 1950s, but they just couldn't beat Oklahoma to win the conference. And with the fact that the Big 8 only had one bowl tie-in, they would yearly get shut out of the bowl games. Colorado would only get to one bowl game through the 1950 decade, and it was in 1956, after Colorado finished 8-2-1 and and were second in the Big 8. But because the Big 8 had a no-repeat rule, Oklahoma, which won the Big 8 the previous year and also won it this year, couldn't go to the Orange Bowl. So Colorado took that draconian rule and went to the 1957 Orange Bowl and won it. But the school was looking for young blood, and Grandulus had that, and when he came to Boulder, he continued the trend of a non-losing season. I mention that because Colorado, yes, they did not have a losing record through this decade, but they only had one bowl game and no conference titles during that decade, which is pretty incredible. They did get a little bit better in 1960 as they went 6-4, and four, and they did beat Oklahoma for the first time since joining the Big A Conference, which was just after after World War II. 1961 would have his best team as they went 9-1 in the regular season. They beat Nebraska and Oklahoma for the second year in a row, and they finally won the Big 8 Conference outright. They would go on to the Orange Bowl facing LSU and lost 25-7, ending their season 9-2, but it was their best season post-World War II, and many were looking towards the future for more great seasons like this. Through the end of the 1961 season and just before that Orange Bowl game, the NCAA was getting some signals that something nefarious was going on at Colorado. What they found was a secret slush fund that was providing money to not only athletes that were currently going to Colorado, but to prospective athletes as well, or to recruits. Along with that, coaches were also providing transportation to athletes to and from the campus and to and from their house 
and to and from their summer jobs on top of that. In the NCAA's eyes, the first charge was seen as the worst, since you're providing financial support to not only your student athletes that were under scholarship, but to prospective athletes that weren't even on campus yet, which I totally understand in the NCAA's eyes. Due to these charges, the NCAA would immediately bring that to the Big 8 and the Board of Regents at Colorado. Due to the mounting evidence and the future punishment that was going to come Colorado's way, the Board of Regents would vote on March 1, 1962, by a vote of 5-1 to one to terminate Granulus's contract with the school. The termination would save Colorado from paying him for the rest of the year. It was also done to save face for the university, as they saw the violations not only as an indictment on the football team, but also towards the University of Colorado. With the termination becoming public, it would create a public outcry in support of Grandulus and the team. There would be several protests, and even a burning of a dummy that was supposed to be of the Colorado president. But the university didn't waver, as the Board of Regents also did a report and found the violations and said about them, these violations are deliberate and willful and were committed with fragrant disregard for well-established university policy. The school also said that the violations began soon after Grandulus came to campus, so they couldn't even blame the guy before him, so that means all the blame was pushed to him. This basically covered the university and other coaches of any harm as well. So now with Grandulus out of the university, the University of Colorado would hire William Bud Davis, who was a Colorado alumni as well as played on the football team. But he was a backup on that team, and what was worse was that Davis had no college assistant or head coaching experience. All Davis had under his belt was a few years of coaching in high school and was an alumni director for Colorado. The new coach would not make friends with anyone and instead turned assistants off of the school, with many saying that they were ready to leave if they had to coach under him. Along with that, the players were even more enraged, with many threatening leaving the school, and some doing it too. The players were looking for a more experienced coach, and not just someone to hold the clipboard for a year or so while they went through all of these penalties. Which was basically what Bud Davis was. He was an alumni director for Colorado, which means basically all he did was ask for money. He was a fundraiser. He, he wasn't a coach at all. But to make matters worse, the NCAA would come in to release their findings on April 27th, about six weeks after Grandulus was terminated. And of course, the NCAA said that their findings were inconclusive, which messed up everything even more. Once again, the NCAA stepped in and made things even worse, but they did agree with the Big 8's penalty of two years TV and bowl game probation, as well as some scholarship losses. So you see how I don't like the NCAA? This case is one of those reasons. They really didn't do anything, and in the end, all they said was, oh yeah, we accept whatever the conference says. So basically, they just wiped their hands of this and didn't have to worry about it. With the penalties and the hiring of an inexperienced coach, at least 20 players lost scholarships or left Colorado. Bud Davis would lead the makeshift 1962 Colorado football team onto the field, and they didn't perform all that well, as they went 2-8. and eight. They only won one Big 8 game that year, but it was versus a terrible Kansas State team, where they won 6 to nothing. And Kansas State is one of the worst programs in like all of Division I history. And Colorado only beating them six to nothing showed that they were basically on the level of them. So that's how far this team dropped. Davis would step down after that terrible season, and Colorado would hire a top Oklahoma assistant and Eddie Crowder to be coach in 1963 and he'd coach Colorado back to winning records, and even won 10 games for Colorado in 1971, which was a first for the team. But what happened to Sonny Grandulus? Well, he would become an assistant coach for the Philadelphia Eagles for 1962 and 63, then he moved to the Detroit Lions in 1964, moving into being a commentator for the Lions after that, from 65 to 67, and he would make one more stop in football, becoming a GM for the Detroit Wheels in 1974, they were in the fledgling World Football League. 
Grandulus, though, would never coach again, even though he could have since there was no show clause at this time, so he could have went to another school if he wanted. But I guess the scandal really hurt him in the eyes of many colleges and really many pro teams, too, because this guy never really coached again after this Colorado penalty. And it was really hard for me to find any sort of information as to what he did. If you noticed in my previous episode I did about Illinois, it was pretty easy to find all the information, how much money was in the slush fund. It was really hard to find how much slush money was in the Colorado slush fund. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm confident in saying it was probably five figures worth in that range. It didn't have any details on which players were paid, and neither did the NCAA findings or the Big 8 findings. They didn't find anything either, which players were paid, but all they really had to hear was that Grandulous was paying not only scholarship players, but that he was paying prospective recruits to the team. Once they heard that, that was pretty much it for him. So that might have been another reason why Grandulous never got hired again, because he looked pretty radioactive from that point. But thank you so much for hanging out with me and checking out this latest episode of Wrong Sports, where I go over another scandal that hit a college football program in the 1960s. If you liked it, please give me a like, share this video with other college football fans, and if you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe to the channel below, ring the bell so you get updates on my brand new videos, and if you want to help out the channel, please do so on my Patreon. The link is in the description below.